Local programming on KRWG made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Your Legislators, a production of KRWG Broadcasting. Your Legislators is a public service program providing our viewing audience in southern New Mexico the opportunity to hear about important legislative issues directly from their elected representatives in Santa Fe. Here's your host, Sloan Patton. Well, thanks for being with us for the last episode of the legislative session. The big news is that the budget has passed. We'll be talking today with Representative Terry McMillan. He's a Republican from Doña Ana District and uh, also a doctor in Las Cruces. Dr. McMillan, thanks so much for being with us. I'm glad to be with you. Appreciate the opportunity. Absolutely. Well, the, the first thing that I'd like to jump right into is some of the bills that, that you've been working on. Now, by the time this airs, the session will be over. Uh, you know, for those of you watching at home, you, you'll know all the results of everything that's passed. But I'd like to talk about a bill that's just one page. It's about two sentences. Uh, bill 152, that one's about the Medical Practice Act. Tell me about that bill. Well, um, most of the legislation that I've carried and, and uh, a lot of my interest and focus has been in this session upon uh, trying to uh, continue our efforts to improve access to health care for New Mexicans. Mm. Uh, the Affordable Care Act, of course, is uh, now in place and we're adjusting to that. It's not perfectly clear yet what the long-term effects are going to be, but if successful, if that legislation is successful, we're going to have more New Mexicans that are going to have a health insurance product and who are going to be uh, presenting systematically for care. Mm. And we're talking about all kinds of health care. Um, as many New Mexicans know, we suffer from a shortage of every type of health care provider there is. Mm. Doctors, nurses, dentists, um, every type of health care provider. And so uh, my focus uh, in this session has been upon um, uh, promoting and bringing legislation that I feel might help uh, I improve our recruiting abilities to New Mexico and, imp and increase our numbers of, uh, of providers. The uh, House Bill 59 is the nurse educator bill. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a bill that uh, ha creates a fund uh, to help uh, educate nurses. One of the problems we have in New Mexico is, uh, of course, we do have a shortage of nurses. It's quite critical. Uh, but um, e even more so do we have a shortage of nurse educators, that is, nurses that could teach in, in our nursing schools. It, it requires significant credentials. Uh, and this nurse educator fund would, would supply loans to nurses who want to pursue advanced degrees. And those loans then, of course, would be forgiven in return for staying and teaching in New Mexico. So this is one of, uh, one of the bills that I think will pass off the floor of the Senate today, and we'll have some funds available to educate nurses. Um, I had another bill uh, which um, is not going to pass in this session, but we'll continue to look at it. And it was a, fairly, uh, a bill that uh, would have brought fairly sweeping uh, tort reform to the area of health care delivery. Um, it provided some protections to hospitals and to every type of licensed health care provider uh, in New Mexico. Uh, it would have uh, placed a cap on some of the awards that are, that, that are, uh, that are given in malpractice cases uh, so that we can have a more um, predictable landscape and provide um, reliable and a reasonable, a financially reasonable protection to providers of health care, including hospitals. Um, this, this piece of legislation is controversial, as you might expect. Um, and it did not make it through the House side, but we did make it through our first committee. And so we will refine it and we may try again at the next session with that piece of legislation. Well, I'd like to talk, you know, the dynamics of this are, are fascinating to me because we have a Republican governor um, you are a Republican, um, and, but talking about health care, um, you know, some people refer to the Affordable Care Act still as Obamacare, uh, even though it was the U.S. Supreme Court that made the final decision on it, and it was essentially created as a, as a tax to citizens that people are now required to have health insurance. But in your daily practice of medicine, what sort of impact do you think this is going to have? I know it's soon, but... Well, there's been no impact in my practice to this point. Right. But we anticipate an impact. 
Hmm. And we don't know what that's going to be. This is a very unpredictable time um, for healthcare providers uh, and hospitals. Uh, many, uh, while on the surface of it, we would expect to have more patients with coverage. It's not sure that that's the case. And one of the problems that uh, some of the uh, purchasers of insurance on the exchange are finding mm. is that the, uh, the co-pays and deductibles for those products are very high. Mm. Uh, you know, if an average working uh, New Mexican has a health insurance policy with a, a deductible that's quite high, in essence, they're kind of without health insurance, mm. at least for the, for the um, you know, run-of-the-mill doctor visits that they may need to make or for outpatient surgeries, uh, prescriptions. The high deductible um, is uh, certainly a catastrophic insurance, but it's going to have an effect on health care delivery as uh, more patients will choose not to pursue care for uh, certain types of health care problems. Mm -hmm. We know also that as a result of the Affordable Care Act passing, our sole community provider funding has gone by the boards. That program is gone. Um, some out there may know that this was a federal program that uh, um, w provided funding to hospitals that provide indigent health care. Under the assumption that uh, when the Affordable Care Act passed that almost everyone would be uh, purchasing insurance products or assisted in purchasing those products, this very important program was uh, dropped. And so one of the things that's going on in the, in the legislature, even at this late hour, is to try to find replacements for about $300 million of federal funding to our hospitals to provide indigent care. Hmm. We know that a lot of the patients are not signing up, and it will be a slow process, and our hospitals have kind of been left in the lurch in this way. <laughs> well, um, I'm holding uh, uh, um, front page of the New Mexico Municipal League uh, legislative bulletin. Everybody gets this. I'm sure you have a copy of it. But the, the heading, this was from uh, just a few days ago. It says budgeting their time. Uh, well, it's uh, talking about the budget, which of course at this point has passed. We now have a budget that both the Senate and the House have approved. Well, let me, uh, le let me correct you. That's, that's hmm. not correct. Oh, have we not? Um, okay. A budget passed the Senate. Oh, I'm that sorry. That budget right. will come to the, the that budget will come to the House today, and um, anything could happen. Uh, to be perfectly honest, mm -hmm. it's a good budget, right? And if it's not um, amended, if it's not successfully amended in any way, I'll be voting for it. And I think, okay. <coughs> pardon me, I'm optimistic that this budget will pass. It's going to be a good budget. Uh, uh, there will be an increase in a, 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 a funding of state government of about 5%, which is a very large increase, um, including 3% um, across the board uh, salary increases for teachers and other state employees. So I think, uh, I think it's a good budget. It also allows the governor to pursue uh, funding to pursue a few of her educational initiatives. So it's a real compromise budget, and that's what we like about it. I, I think uh, what's important about the budget is I think it will get out today. Mm -hmm. It is a compromise budget, and I think New Mexicans can feel good that they have they have a bipartisan legislature. And this budget is a budget that uh, that um, is a good compromise in which both sides uh, gave up some of the things they wanted. Um, and I think that's evidence of a good budgetary process and the fact that we have a bipartisan legislature. Mm -hmm. Well, and uh, in that passage from the Senate, um, a lot of people would probably say that, you know, getting it through the Senate was the, the difficult thing to do. And at this point now, being, being in front of the House, do you see many members of the House trying to vote against it and trying to stop it at this point? Honestly, I think, uh, I think not. Yeah. Uh, the, the budget uh, begins in the House. Yeah. And uh, we were not able to get a budget out of our House uh, earlier in the session. And so the Senate took up deliberations, and they honestly uh, took up our old budget, mm. uh, dusted it off, made a few minor changes, passed it, and sent it back to us. And so I think, yeah. I think we're going to wind up passing this budget. Yeah. <coughs> well, uh, I saw a statement from uh, Governor Martinez. She said that you know the current um, version of the budget uh, had some things that she, of course, did not want to see in it. Some expenditures she wanted to to shave it down as as small as possible, but. One thing that she mentioned specifically was was that nursing education and healthcare education, and that the budget contains several measures 
for, um, for you know for continuing education for nurses do you think that she was referring to the the ones that you've put in there the the bills that you've passed well um, one of one of the, um, the the issues she's talking about is my bill but there yeah. were several uh, measures um, and and I don't know the outcome of those yet we're still uh, you know we have 26, 27 more hours uh, in this legislature, and many of the biggest issues have yet to be resolved. Mm -hmm. And this is not uncommon. Yeah. Uh, so for me to predict uh, the outcome of everything would be inappropriate. But mm -hmm. the governor had several initiatives. We'll see which of them is going to pass. I believe mine's going to pass off the Senate floor today for her to sign. But several, she had several initiatives, including uh, uh, increasing the amount of uh, uh, monies that are available to loan um, uh, to uh, students in the health care areas, mm -hmm. uh, increasing the number of residency spots for primary care physicians, increasing the forgiveness program that, uh, that uh, loans money for education and then forgives those loans when providers stay in New Mexico. Um, uh, there, there were several uh, of these bills. Uh, also a, a bill to expedite the licensing process when uh, physicians or nurses migrate into New Mexico so mm. we will not be able to see uh, the total picture until we've crossed the finish, the finish line at a sprint right. uh, and then catch our breath and look in, uh, back and see how much of it we've gotten accomplished. Right. Well, right, those last final, final minutes, especially as we saw last session, really, really do uh, play an important part. I mean, the, the budget was passed at the very last minute last year and um, well, this year, I mean, what do you think are going to be those those items you know in the in the next 24 26 hours what do you think is really going to to be decided at the last minute well at, at beginning with the budget and so many times um, in the legislative process the 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 the, the dam doesn't break until the budget gets through mm. and then once we have an agreement a bipartisan uh, budget and there's good contentment with that then the doors kind of swing open <coughs> and a lot of the other issues get solved pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I'm anxious to see is a, a solution to our lottery scholarship problem. And uh, the fate of uh, that program is still hanging in the balance. Now, there are monies in this budget that are gonna, that are gonna carry the lottery scholarship uh, for another year. But we don't have a plan for how to reform that uh, scholarship as yet. And, uh, and keep it viable for the long-term future. Mm -hmm. And we hope that we will, we will find, uh, and, uh, there are several bills that are going in different directions. And uh, we hope that one of them will get consensus and that we can get this problem uh, solved before the end of the session. Mm -hmm. An issue that's been brought up that affects <coughs> Southern New Mexico quite a bit, uh, your colleague uh, Lee Cotter introduced a bill about the spaceport, about funding for it. What are your thoughts on the spaceport? There, there are a couple of issues about the spaceport that Las Cruces and <coughs> people in Doniana County need to know about. Lee Cotter's uh -huh. bill is an effort to uh, try to uh, raise awareness about the fact that Doniana County uh, taxpayers are paying a, a large portion of the bill to build that, uh, to build that spaceport. Mm -hmm. In the absence of a southern road, we don't get much benefit out of it. Right. And to date, we still don't have one. We know there are plans and funding has been allocated and that road is going to start being upgraded uh, this year. Okay. But we need a really good road, not, 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 a, not a serviceable road. Mm. We need a good road. And the Spaceport Authority, um, I think Lee is trying to get their attention uh, to our needs. Mm. I support him in concept, but I probably will not support interrupting the day-to-day -day funding of the Spaceport for another year or two. Mm -hmm. <coughs> there is a... Uh, there's another issue affecting the spaceport that uh, your Las Cruces uh, delegation fought hard against, and that is a measure to, to take the 25% of our uh, spaceport tax that we've been spending on local educational initiatives mm. and force that through the equalization formula for the entire state. Mm -hmm. We, in, uh, in the, on the House side, your legislative consist, cont uh, con contingent really coalesced around resisting this bill. That money was promised to Doniana County taxpayers and the, the state at large threatens to remove it and put it and divide it up through the equalization formula. We've used that very effectively for excellent STEM programs in our school districts and uh, we've, we're fighting to prevent that uh, bill from passing and we're optimistic. It passed through the House 
we're optimistic that hopefully our colleagues on the Senate side can stop that. Mm. Well, um, with the spaceport, I mean, do you think that it's, it sounds like you do support it as an idea of um, something that will draw tourism, something that will draw funding into our area. Is I'm sorry, what what's the question? Well, um, with the spaceport, I, I'd just like to talk a little bit more about, you know, your, how you feel about it. I mean, it's a, it sounds like you are in full support, you know, of, of the spaceport as a, as a tourist destination and as a way to, is it also a way to bring in money, um, you know, from the visitors? We would like, um, I, I think long term, um, the, the future of the spaceport is, uh, is really outside the ability to take uh, visitors on a brief excursion to space. Mm. Um, uh, um, when Virgin Galactic is routinely sending uh, air, uh, craft into suborbital space, <coughs> I think that's going to open the doors for a lot of interest that might want to have a footprint on our spaceport mm. and have access to space, whether it's to launch satellites or do any number of research work. Down the road, I think the future of the spaceport is well beyond just taking tourists to space. Um, we don't know yet if it's if it's going to if it's going to make it and if it's going to be the big boon that many had envisioned, but the truth is we've got 200 million dollars invested in it, and this is not the time to pull the plug. Mm -hmm. We're very close. Uh, I think we're very close to success, mm -hmm. and so I'll continue to support uh, the idea of the spaceport, but I'll also continue to support the notion that Las Cruces needs a southern road. Mm -hmm. Besides the Southern Road, what challenges do you see in the next two to three years with the spaceport? I think the main challenge is just to get someone in space. Um, um, Mr. Branson has uh, um, indicated once again that uh, they will put somebody into suborbital sub space this year. Hmm. Now, we've heard that before. Right. But I think, uh, I, I think it's critical um, that he carry through with that promise. In fact, he's indicated that his own family may be the first ones to go. But we'd like to see that happen this year. And when we see that happen in a, in a successful flight, we know I, I, I'll be confident that in the end, this is going to be a, a successful investment by Dunyana County residents. Hmm. Well, Las Cruces Public Schools recently passed a bond initiative. We covered this issue um, here at KRWG and, uh, and interviewed Stan Rounds, the superintendent, about it. Uh, it means several million dollars for, for the public schools here. And one of the things that they are going to use the money for, and, and besides just improving the buildings that they have built, they're going to be ramping up some of the efforts with uh, schools that are early college high schools, like Arrowhead. And um, what do you think is the future of these early college high schools? I think they have a bright future, and uh, <clears throat> I think uh, I think uh, Superintendent Rounds and, <clears throat> and our school board are doing uh, cutting edge work here. I think our current uh, early college high school is a, is a smashing success and creates a situation where young people who are really motivated um, can, can access an environment where they get dual credits, uh, they can focus on advancing their education uh, quickly. Um, many of these high school graduates are, are going to be close to having, if not having, an associate's degree when they're done. Um, it's a great innovation, and I know there are plans for the uh, 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 health sciences related early college high school on the, on the Arrowhead campus there. And the governor has plans for several other early college high schools around the state. I think it's a fantastic innovation, I, and, I, and I'm proud of our community that we're the ones that uh, spearheaded this. Mm. If for whatever reason in the next you know, five or ten years, if, if um, these schools aren't supported with funding, how, um, you know, what would be the impact on education and, and especially with health care? I mean, will we, will we have enough nurses if, for whatever reason, early college high schools don't pan out as, as well as, as we see? I mean, are those completely tied together or are they independent? No, no, those aren't that closely tied together. Um, um, the, the current early college high school uh, that's been uh, in place in Las Cruces for several years is a smashing success in that it has absolutely no dropouts. Mm. And the kids are, are finishing their, and getting their high school diplomas and they're, uh, they're, many of them have uh, many hours of uh, college credit. They're well on their way to uh, careers 
uh, that will provide them uh, with a good living and benefits. Th this early college high school we currently have doesn't focus on nursing or health care, but one is in the works. And it would, it would focus on all types of uh, health care careers and, and put young people in a position uh, to pursue a health care career of some form or fashion beginning in high school. And it'll accelerate their training and get them there quicker. Mm. I think it's a great innovation. Mm. Uh, the, the shortages that we're experiencing in nurses and other health care providers generally uh, are a consequence of the fact that we are a rural and poor state. Mm. It's not easy to recruit um, the, uh, the kind of providers we need to New Mexico. We're up against some long odds and this is uh, one of the reasons uh, that um, I think one of the things we can do is, is modify our tort environment and mm. at least make a fairly uh, an environment for health care providers when compared to surrounding states they would find inviting and comfortable um, it's, this is one of the things that we can do to try to improve our uh, recruiting of health care providers and our retention of health care providers. Yeah. Well, I'd like to go back, um, since we have a little bit more time uh, to talk, you know, about five or six more minutes, um, with the malpractice lawsuits, the, the capping on that, I know we talked about how it's obviously, of course, a controversial issue and, like you said, is, is likely not to pass this session. What um, what are what really are the dynamics you know for for someone like myself and others who may be watching who aren't doctors and who well and who first of all I'm going to uh, emphasize a, uh, you know in New Mexico and in the United States today while, while it may be the case that uh, doctors are still at the um, top of the ladder hmm. we 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 have all types of health care providers that are absolutely critical to delivering health care and. Um, the legislation that I've, uh, that, that I've introduced includes all types of health care providers that are licensed by the state. We need more physicians, we need more dentists, we need more uh, uh, nurses, we need more optometrists. I mean, any, any, any particular area of health delivery, um, we're sure we have a shortage. Um, next door in Texas, um, awards in malpractice lawsuits are capped. And that, that, that legislation took place uh, 10 years ago. It was not an easy thing to accomplish, but um, Texas has seen a huge influx of providers mm -hmm. because it's an inviting environment. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, California and Colorado also passed this legislation long ago. California's had this cap in place on awards for pain and suffering since 1975. Uh, this is not, we're not, um, you know, th this is not an unusual uh, piece of legislation. Uh, many other states have taken steps to try to protect their providers in a reasonable way. Um, and, and I think this will be important as one of the tools we use to try to, to provide access to health care for New Mexicans. Hmm. Besides the caps, what would you say to a doctor who's trying to decide between moving his family, his or her family, to Texas or New Mexico? What would you say to them, you know, unrelated to the caps? Why should they move to New Mexico? So outside uh, um, the um, protections that uh, they would be offered in Texas? Right. Um, I, I, um, I could offer them um, uh, mostly the, uh, the uh, scenic beauty of our state the beautiful climate and environment, uh, the diversity of people. It's a wonderful place to live. Um, and I would, if I were trying to recruit someone into my practice, I would emphasize those things. And I would, have, I would be in a position of having to try to de-emphasize perhaps the uh, tort environment that they might be exposed to. Uh, it, it doesn't compare favorably to uh, some of the surrounding states, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, the American healthcare system is unique in that um, a, a lot of people just assume that, you know, doctors in this country make make a lot of money, which is which can generally be true. But in this country, the lawsuits, as far as I understand, are much higher than in other countries. And I I don't know if you'd feel comfortable sharing how much you pay in um, in insurance towards that sort of thing. But I've heard that it's a lot. You know, it's a lot of money that people don't understand that you have to pay every month. Um, in case you're sued for $10 million or $20 million? Well, that's true. And, and the amount that uh, malpractice insurance 
um, the premiums that, that are required to purchase a product uh, for protection depends upon the, uh, the specialty. Mm. Um, one of the reasons that um, obstetricians uh, actually seldom deliver babies anymore is because of the, the medical malpractice exposure. Mm. An obstetrician uh, who's act actively delivering uh, babies might pay um, 80000 100000 or more per year mm -hmm. just for malpractice insurance coverage. Yeah. Some of the other specialties are, are, um, are pretty difficult as well. Neurosurgery is, the, the premiums are astronomical and this is why uh, neurosurgeons are in such short supply. General surgeons are exposed. <coughs> Their premiums can be sixty to 80000 per year. Uh, mine are a little more modest and more along the lines of twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars per year that I pay for an insurance product. Right. And, and, and let me make this point. Sure. For a healthcare. Just about a for a healthcare. Left, go, ahead. go ahead. We just have we just have just about a minute left. But go ahead. Well, let me say this: for a healthcare provider, whether it's a doctor, a nurse, uh, whoever the uh, provider may be that's being sued, hmm. um, a malpractice lawsuit isn't just about the dollars and cents. It, it, it's intensely personal and if, if a provider is facing having to go through a suit every couple of years or whatever may be the environment, it is, an, it is really uh, um, a personal and very negative personal experience to have to go through this time and time again. So it's more than just the dollars and cents. <coughs> I think we need to try to provide a safer environment for healthcare providers to deliver care. We value uh, what, uh, what they provide. We try to recruit it. We need to do more to create a safe environment uh, where they can enjoy practicing. Representative McMillan, thanks so much for being with us. It's my pleasure, thank you. Well, and thank you for joining us as always for this session of Your Legislators. Thank you.